Willkommen zu der letzten Panel-Diskussion hier beim Herbstforum heute. Herr Hegermann hat es schon gesagt, es geht jetzt um ein Streitgespräch zwischen dem äh, bedingungslosen Grundeinkommen auf der einen Seite und sozialen Investitionen auf der anderen Seite. Und wenn wir uns die letzten zwei Tagen so einmal Revue passieren lassen und uns überlegen, wo haben wir gestern angefangen bei der Frage der sozialen Rechte, der europäischen Säule der sozialen Rechte, und dem Vortrag von Florian Rödel und dann nochmal springen auf den Vortrag von heute Morgen von der griechischen Arbeitsministerin, die ja sehr schön unterschieden hat zwischen sozialen Rechten auf der einen Seite und sozialem Schutz, also was sie Social Protection nannte, auf der anderen Seite und auch von dem aktiven Recht auf Arbeit gesprochen hat. Da wird auch schon ein Gegensatz deutlich und ich glaube, in unserer ähm, Diskussion jetzt werden wir genau über diese Gegensätzlichkeit oder über den Spannungsbogen zwischen Recht auf Arbeit und äh, die, sozialen Rechten sprechen und dem sozialen Schutz auf der, einen, auf der anderen Seite. Ich werde ähm, dieses Panel in Englisch äh, moderieren und werde jetzt auch gleich äh, auf Englisch sprechen, weil ich glaube, dass es für die Diskussion einfacher ist, als wenn ich jetzt äh, Deutsch spreche und beide unserer Protagonisten ähm, auf Englisch antworten. Uh, so I will say a few words about the, the topic, what we're facing and what we want to do today. I have two protagonists here who will present two different views about the future of the welfare state and the future of work, I hope. And the context in which I want to situate that is the overall context of social rights which we had over the last two days. And I think if we, if we look into the future, if we look into the future of work, but also in the future of the welfare state, we have a number of challenges which uh, we are facing currently. And one is the challenge of um, the future of employment and the role of technology in the future of employment. We have a discussion on digitalization. What will digitalization do to the labor market? At the same time, and that is very much a future-oriented debate because it hasn't happened yet. We don't have, we haven't seen any major impacts of digitalization on the on the labor market yet. But what we have already seen over the last two decades or so is an increasing dualization of the labor market, and we have an in increase in precarious work, and we have an increase in self-employment, solo self-employment. All the discussions we had uh, yesterday and today. So we have precarious work, we have an impact of digitalization, but we also have a long-term trend and that has to do with the changes in the family and in particular with the changes in the role of women on the labor market. And we have a move from the sole breadwinner model, which we had in the 1950s and 60s, to a much more individualized type of labor market where women insist and do want to have their own protection and their own income, which wasn't the case in the past. And all these changes, the structural changes, but also the anticipated future changes which come from technology pose the problem, how do, we, how do we want to structure and restructure the welfare state, our social provision, our social protection, and the way we earn our incomes? And I think that this is the question we, we should uh, address in this debate. And for this, um, I have uh, two brilliant speakers because they are not both very experienced in what they talk about. And um, to my left, the first, first person on, on my left is uh, Yannick van der Borgt, and he has been working on the issue of, uh, of the uh, unconditional basic income together with Philip van Paradijs for the last 10 or 12 years. So he has spent his entire academic career researching and propagating the, the unconditional basic income. He is a professor of political science at the Uni Université St. Louis in Brussels, <clears throat> and he is also a guest professor at the Université Catholique de Louvain. And uh, he will give a short presentation of why, why he thinks that the unconditional basic income might be an answer to the problems we're facing. And next to him, we have uh, Bruno Pallier, Bruno Pallier is the research director of the CNRS at the Science po, uh, in Sciences Po in Paris. He is also a co-director of an institute which deals with the evaluation of public policies. Bruno Pallier is, uh, is well known about, uh, for his work on the welfare state. He uh, did uh, big comparative studies on the Bismarckian welfare states, but he also had a big project on what you call social investment. And he propagates... Uh, a different answer to the same problem because he says we need to invest, we need to invest in human capital, we need to invest in education, and this is a, a different and a 
for, uh, from his point of view, the better way to answer this question which we are raising. So the format of the discussion is that both of them have about 10 minutes each to present their points of views, and they have slides, so they, they will give short presentations, but we don't want to have too long presentations, and I will stop them if they get too long. And then I will ask a couple of questions, and then I open it to the audience. So Yannick, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you very much for your inv invitation to make a presentation uh, at the occasion of this conference. I'm very impressed and I would like to apologize because I'm totally unable to do this in German, although German is one of our official languages in Belgium. So I'll do it in English. And since I only have 10 minutes, uh, I will only sketch very briefly the reasons why I think that the basic income, contrary to what you might think, is compatible with the social investment strategy. And indeed, I think that if we want uh, the social investment strategy to be progressive, a basic income is a key component. So basically, the key claim here is that uh, we must combine an investment strategy with a protection strategy. And this is exactly what the basic income can do. In order to explain that, I'd like to focus first on two core features of the social investment uh, strategy. Of course, Bruno will get back to this later on. Uh, there is no general agreement among scholars about the exact definition of social investment, but I think that most of us would agree about the two core features I'm going to mention here. And both of them uh, are di directly related to the rapidly changing labor market that Anke uh, was referring to. The first one is the emphasis on human capital. So, and this translates, of course, in the idea that we should give priority to education, training, skill acquisition, not only for the young, for children, but also for adults through lifelong learning. So that's the first uh, key feature. And a second key feature is the idea that transitions should be, make, uh, should be made easier and more secure. And by transitions here, I mean the transitions between different types of activities, between different types of jobs, between the labor market and activities outside of the labor market. This is important in this rap rapidly changing uh, uh, labor market, right? So these two core features, you should keep them in mind because I think that, as I will try to show, basic income helps us to achieve these objectives. Now, what's really fascinating with the social investment literature and the social investment strategy is that social policy is no longer seen as a mere cost, but is considered to be an investment, a productive factor. And uh, I will try to show now, very briefly, how basic income can fit into this uh, strategy. So, second point, the basic income, uh, perhaps a small reminder for some of you, most of you, I guess, uh, know what is a basic income, a Grundeinkommen in German. It's a regular income paid to, uh, in cash to every individual member of society, irrespective of income from other sources and with no strings attached. Okay, so uh, the German discussion is quite intense, so I guess that most of you know this, uh, this proposal, but you should keep three uh, features of this proposal in mind when discussing it and before rejecting it too quickly. The first feature is that it's strictly individual. It's paid to individuals. It's, a, it's an individual entitlement. The second feature is uh, the idea that it's universal, which means that it's non-means-tested, okay? So it's irrespective of income from other sources. And finally, perhaps the most controversial feature, uh, at least philosophically, is the idea that it's obligation-free. So it's paid unconditionally with no strings attached. Actually, in our book, in the first version of the book with Philip, we had called this third feature duty-free. It's duty-free in the sense of non, uh, not, not attached to any duties, but the publisher preferred us to, to uh, use obligation-free. Now, the idea is full of paradoxes, uh, full of paradoxes, especially, for instance, when you look at the second feature. I think I could show, I don't have the time to do this here, 
But uh, the fact that it's non mis tested, which means it's not targeted at the poor, turns basic income into a powerful instrument against poverty. So that might sound paradoxical, but I think that universalism is very important in an anti-poverty strategy. Another paradox, and that's the one I focus on today, is the fact that despite the idea that it's obligation-free, despite the idea that it's fully unconditional, it could, under certain conditions, have a positive impact on human capital. Okay, so I focus on that paradox here. And in order, in order to understand this, I think we need to understand that basic income is at the conjunction, at the encounter of two types of freedom. The first type of freedom is what I would call here freedom from employment. Okay, and that's perhaps the most well-known of these two freedoms. An obligation-free basic income gives everyone the power to say no to some jobs, some occupations, that possible takers will find too degrading, unpromising, uh, too poorly paid, etc. So it's obligation free, it's at the exact opposite from workfare or here in Germany, Hartzfeer type of schemes. And this is obviously, this first freedom, one of the key reasons why some trade unions and some union members today in Europe defend the basic income. For the first time in the history of capitalism, uh, workers would not be forced to sell their labor force and still be entitled to a modest income floor. Of course, I'm also aware of the fact that this first freedom is larger when the amount of the basic income is higher. But still, even a mo modest partial basic income can already make a difference, especially because it can be combined with uh, income from other sources. So this can be called the exit option. Freedom from employment. But there is a second type of freedom that you should never forget because it's combined with the, fir with the first. And I, call, I would call this one the freedom from unemployment or the freedom from inactivity. The power to say yes to some jobs and some occupations. The means-tested benefits, the current means-tested benefits, social assistance benefits, for instance, tend to trap people in unemployment. Uh, as soon as you get a job, as soon as you improve your income, as soon as you get one euro uh, in a job, you start losing the right to a benefit because the benefit is means-tested. So access to employment in that sense is financially unattractive. So that's the reason why, I think not the only reason why, but that's one of the reasons why we should get rid of the means test. And that's, in fact, what we do already in many cases. We do it for some universal services. Think of universal healthcare, universal education. And we also do it for some universal cash transfers. So for instance, the child benefits in Germany or Belgium are universal in cash. And basic pensions in some countries, the Netherlands and Denmark. A universal benefit can be kept when you access, when you take a job. So the power to say yes to some occupations, uh, in some sense you could say a basic income is a job subsidy. It's a job subsidy, but it's a subsidy that is not given to the employer, but to workers, and that makes a big difference. Right, I'm almost uh, done with this second freedom and then I will conclude, but I want to stress the fact that it's more than a job subsidy. A basic income is also, still in the second sense, the second freedom, it's also um, a subsidy to all other forms of activity, including, of course, studying, training, taking internships, caring for relative dependents, especially children. A basic income would allow us to pause when we need it in our professional life. It allows people to take risks and to be creative. So in that sense, I think the second freedom should be understood um, in a broad sense. In a broad sense, it opens new options to be active in a meaningful sense, and not only be active in a, in a sense that has been determined by a welfare officer, by a union leader, or by a social worker. It is an occupation in a meaningful sense that has been determined by the individuals themselves. 
And all this, I think, would have a positive impact on human capital. Just imagine for one moment the difference it could make if students could benefit from a basic income. That would help them to cover the cost, the opportunity cost, cost represented by higher education. Or for young people who would like to take an internship, an unpaid internship. Many of them cannot take these unpaid internships because of the opportunity costs, which is too high. And you, of course, you understand also that it makes transitions easier between different types of activities, different types of jobs. Uh, let me just conclude then this brief statement, very brief, very rough, by saying that obviously I'm perfectly aware of the fact that uh, basic, in um, basic income is not a magic bullet. Contrary to what you might sometimes read in the literature, it will not solve all our problems. Uh, we need the right combination between cash transfers and services. And if human capital is to be at the core of our strategy, we obviously need to invest more and better in educational opportunities. But at the core of this strategy, I strongly believe that we also need a guarantee of a modest guarantee of income security. And this is why we need a basic income. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anker, for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, and even, uh, even though uh, Anker would like that, I, I will not be fighting with, uh, with Yannick. He said uh, really great things about that. But I, I'd like to focus my introduction in uh, the same 10 minutes on, on why we need uh, new welfare systems and uh, what are the challenges. And, and uh, perhaps we come back on the, in the discussion on that. Okay, so the first is to, to reiterate what, what has uh, said Yannick, but just to mention that social investment is thought as social policy in connection with the changes in the society, the new social risk, but also in connection with the changes in our economies, and I'd like to emphasize that. So the idea here is that uh, we are shifting towards a service economy, more and more jobs are created in the service sector, but also more and more brain qualification skill matter for the economy, but also for people. To put it differently, not having enough skill or the right skill has become a social risk, as much as being old, being sick, or having an industrial injury, in the sense that if you look at the fate of unskilled or poorly skilled people in our societies, Germany as much as uh, the rest of Europe, you will see that these people are almost certain not to be able to have a decent wage, a secure uh, career, and this kind of thing. They, they will be precarious. And the reason is that skill and qualification is now key for productivity and economic growth. This is what this means here. But the, the, the second point, which requires some changes in our welfare systems, is that social risks have changed and I will come back on that. Uh, we know population aging, we know uh, dependency for the frail elderly, but we know a bit less about shift in poverty. Uh, we know a bit less in the emergence of precarious uh, jobs, uh, the dualization or po polarization of labor market I'd like to come back on. Just to, to show big data, between 1945 and now, look at what is the fate of the industrial sector in terms of uh, uh, employment creation, both in the US and in Europe, and you see this is flat in the US and going down in, uh, in the EU. And Germany is the exception where over the last years some jobs have been created in manufacturing industry, but this is really exceptional and we perhaps cannot expect this to, to last. So uh, the, the tertiary sector, the, the, the service is the one creating jobs, and if we look at the kind of jobs which are created within the uh, service sector, we see that a lot of so-called low-skilled, poorly paid jobs are created, social services, personal services is really the one on the top of uh, job creation. This graph, we may come back on the, on the discussion, that's the trend in terms of destruction and creation of jobs, not in terms of volume of jobs, the volume of jobs are still there. In the, the mid-skilled, mid-paid jobs, this is where you found 
most of the jobs, most of the people, but this is also where jobs are destroyed, and people have either hope to have a better jobs in their future or for their children, but a lot of people know that they will fall down. They will not be able to have a relatively middle pay, middle skilled jobs because of uh, the technological transformation, these kind of things. And we, we may come back on that because this creates uh, a lot of uh, challenges for our uh, economies, societies, but also political ones. I've been working on what kind of vote do these people have, and they vote more for Trump, more for Brexit, more for AFD, more for uh, Le Pen in uh, Front National in France. Really, th there is a, a correlation there. So this is a big challenge, and they are asking for security and these kind of things. Okay, and this, this is not over. There, there is a debate currently, but OECD has produced data showing that even up to 19, uh, 2015, we continue to see uh, destruction of jobs in the middle of the pay uh, slip everywhere in Europe, more in Southern Europe and Northern Europe than in Western Europe, but still, uh, th this pattern is, uh, seems to be structural. And as uh, Anke say, we don't see it really because, once again, the volume of jobs is still in the middle, but this is where jobs are disappearing. Now, another thing uh, which is absolutely key and lead to the emphasis on uh, human capital is that all over the places in OECD countries in Europe, you see that higher the skill, higher the labor market participation. If you have high skill, which is uh, tertiary education, you have participation rate, which is about 80% of those having high skill. There is almost no unemployment for them. And there is uh, certainty of being uh, a job. If you're mid-skill, it's still you will have some job. And this, this is where we don't see the, the real impact of uh, polarization. But look at the, the, those ones, those who are below upper secondary education, depending on the country, but you see that the rate of participation can be extremely low. And on average in Europe, it's around 40, 45 percent. This is why I'm speaking about a new social risk. If you don't have qualification and skill, you are very unlikely to have a stable position on the labor market. Okay, beyond that, there are many new social risks that our traditional, I call them Bismarckian welfare systems, the German one, the French one, the Belgian one, are not well equipped to be dealing with. Uh, the first one is to realize that there is a big change in the pattern of poverty. The poor of today are not the poor of 30 years ago. To put it bluntly, the elderly are not the most poor. The poor are not the elderly anymore, thanks to the welfare state. The problem is that poverty hasn't disappeared. It has been removed from the uh, old age, uh, but it's, uh, it, it has increased uh, elsewhere. Where? amongst younger people, among uh, young people. And the point here about youth is that youth is a kind of new thing. Now you're thinking, what is he speaking about? I've been young, we've all been young. Yes, but you've been young for five years, seven years. Now to be young, is, it lasts 15 years. From compulsory education to first child, there is 15 years, 16 to 31 in Europe. From compulsory education to leaving your parents, there is something like 10 to 20 years. In Italy, on average, youngsters leave parents' home at the age of 33. 24, 25 France or Germany. 19 in Sweden. First stable job, on average, 25. So it takes time to transit from childhood to adulthood, and the German welfare state, the French welfare state, the Belgian welfare state is not supporting young people. It's, it, it's asking, ask your parents, right? And if the parents are rich, it's okay. If the parents are poor, it's not. Single parenthood, those who are the most likely to be poor today in Europe are single mothers. 50% of the single mothers in Europe today are at risk of poverty. A third in France, a third, almost a third in Germany. This is where you have the poverty. Why is that? Because they cannot both take care of their children and work. 
and be looking for trouble. What do we need? Give them money, perhaps. But take care of their kids, for sure, so that they are available for work. We still have a huge problem. Women have entered the labor market. If you look at participation rate, they are almost the same, but not the same career, the same labor market participation, and not the same welfare state. I have some data, I will not have time to show that, but if we have a wage gap, which is more or less 20% in Germany, in France, and in Europe, we have a pension gap, which is 40%. So we have a welfare state which is multiplying inequalities for youngsters, for children, and for women. Then we have more and more uh, lack of continuous careers, more pre precarious forms of contracts. You know, in France is champion of that. We have millions of contracts of less than a week. We have, uh, but in Germany also you have uh, not typical contracts, uh, mini and midi jobs, and this of course calls for probably basic income, and, or at least continuity of income, uh, but this is a huge problem. And the last one. Okay, so I will not go through that, but I have many uh, data which shows, and just look at the title here. Since the crisis, disposable income has fallen in real terms to all age groups except for the elderly. That's what our welfare state is doing now, good for the elderly. But there are some neglected people, these ones, the ones who became poorer and poorer since the crisis, the children, the youth, almost 25% of youngsters, of children, are at risk of poverty today in, 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 in Europe. Look at this number about single parents, half of them in Europe. It's a bit less in Germany and France, but still, it's a lot. Now on the needs, you've heard that. The, the youngsters who are neither in, in employment, education, or training. This is not so much in Germany, but this is a lot in many places in Europe. And these guys, these youngsters, they are very likely to have a bad life for the rest of their uh, life. Gender gaps, a lot of data, and this is the one in pension, and Germany is really performing badly here, 40% less in, in, in pension. And look at that. In many countries, having children deteriorate the careers of women, improve the career of men, except in Nordic countries. So we have to do things, and uh, this is precarization of, of jobs. We have to do that. Invest in human capital, mobilize human capital. It's useless to train somebody if this person cannot work because she has to take care of the kids, she has to take care of the freight parents, she has to take care of the handicapped. And of course, we cannot think that one is enough, once is enough, you know, primary education is okay and then it's okay. No, lifelong learning is absolutely key. That's what social investment is about. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, just here, prepare rather than repair is key for our uh, time. Here are the policies, and I will finish on that. And this is why, if you say we are complementary, I agree. But you cannot pretend to be a substitute for social investment. Because social investment means targeting policies towards children, youngsters, and women first. And this is implementing services. Childcare, elderly care, education, training. This is not money. And giving money to people is not the right solution. Because we know that in the name of free choice, people don't do the same choice. If you give money to a family, the low-skilled family will ask the mother to stay home, take care of the kids. And the educated family will use the money to pay for childcare. And we will have just a continuation of inequalities, because going to childcare is important for the career of the woman, and it is very important for the emancipation of the children. So I'm in favor of universalism as much as Yannick, but for the services, for access to childcare, elderly care, handicapped care. It's absolutely key, and I will stop there. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Yannick, and thank you very much, Bruno. And Bruno put about 20 slides in 10 minutes. That must be a record now. I would like to ask two questions to both of you before I open the floor. And to Yannick, I, I would like to start with Yannick. And to me, the basic income debate is, um, I, I often find it strange that you discuss 
the problems you want to address and the freedom from employment, the freedom from, uh, uh, from inactivity, and then propose a solution like the basic income. Because if you look at the group of people who would benefit from the basic income, you would look at the 10% of society who might be in, in work poverty or who might be on low paid or live in, in, in households who have low incomes. But in order to help 10% of society, you have to change the tax and social spending system completely. If you look at calculations of what it takes to provide a basic, in a meaningful basic income, not a small basic income, but a meaningful basic income, and if you add up the numbers, in the German context, for instance, you have to take all the social spending of the German government completely, and you have to eradicate everything, the pension system, the healthcare system, etc. You, you put that together, and you, t you spend it on a basic income. So why, if we, if we only address, if we really, for those who would make a difference, if we only want to address the, 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 the bottom 10%, why can't we think of solutions that target these people and give more freedom to people who, who would actually benefit from them without getting rid of the rest of the social protection system? Okay, good question, but I just want to ask you a question before I answer. Would you also then think that we should target healthcare and education and that the rich should pay for using healthcare and education? Well, Why the, universalism would be a good thing for services and not for cash transfers? Well, we, you know, we do ask the, the rich to pay for healthcare yeah. and we do ask the rich... Through the tax we, system, right? Yeah, we, okay. we, we ask everyone who is exactly. able to pay to pay for healthcare, for education, exactly. for the services as well. As well. So, the, 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 obviously, the idea of a basic income is not to make the rich richer, but provided it's financed through, and it's not always the case, we were discussing this uh, with Bruno uh, earlier on, it's not always the case in all scenarios, but the most plausible scenarios that are advocated by many economists, including some Nobel Prize in economics, are um, based on the idea that you should have a progressive tax system in order to uh, fund the basic income, which means that obviously, like is the case for any universal type of uh, transfer, be it in kind or in cash, you will have net contributors and net beneficiaries. The key thing, I, especially when we think about transitions uh, or about the young becoming older, etc., is that very often when we look at these figures, we see that, okay, for some simulations I have in Belgium, for instance, the, the upper deciles of the income distribution would be net contributors and the lower deciles would be net beneficiaries. But what's, what's key, I think, when we think, think about transitions is that I could be a net beneficiary when I'm young, when I'm 20, 25, like Bruno mentioned. But then when I get a stable job, when I get a higher income, I become a net beneficiary. And so it's, you have to look at this in dynamic terms. Being a net beneficiary does not mean that you will stay a net beneficiary. Now, the idea, I think, is exactly the same as for universal services. You would have to finance it somehow, and in our countries, we don't have natural resources, we don't have oil, we cannot pay a dividend out of the uh, uh, oil exploitation as they do in some states in the US. So we have to pay it from, from the taxes. So some people will pay for it. Now, you could say, well, then it doesn't make sense because you give the money, but then you take it back through the tax system. But then I think in order to understand why it makes sense, we need to look at all the problems we, ha we have with targeting. When you want to target, you first have to identify your target, and we know that it's not an easy task and it's costly. When you have it identify, you, uh, identified your target, you, you want to make sure that people in the target get the benefit, and we know that the take-up rate of targeted benefits is quite low. In France and Belgium, I don't know about Germany, but we are, we are at about 50 to 60% take-up rate. Which means that 40% of the people who are entitled to the targeted benefit do not get it. We are at almost 100% take-up rate for the child benefit. Why? Because it's universal. So I think it makes sense to, make, to turn, uh, to turn uh, means-tested schemes into universal schemes, but obviously someone has to pay for it. I would agree with that, but I think it makes sense. 
When you, there, in the German debate, there, there are always two camps which uh, discuss the basic income, and one is the economist camp, and from the economist perspective, they do assume that you would take away most of the social protection system and that you would finance the basic income through the tax system and uh, arguing you don't need social protection anymore because you have the basic income and ignoring the fact that you would then, in old age, for instance, you would have everyone on a very low old age pension because you, you get rid on the, on the, uh, of the normal uh, pension system. The, the people on the left, on the other hand, they would assume, no, we get the basic income on top. We keep our pension system, we keep our, uh, our, our other uh, cash transfers, and we would have another tax, an additional tax, through which we uh, uh, would finance the, the basic income. Given the fact, if you look at the, the uh, transformation of the tax system over the last 20 years, if you look at how the high income taxes have come down, how corporate taxes have come down, I find it surprising that people on the left assume that they could increase taxation to such an ex uh, extent that they could fund a basic universal income in addition to the social protection schemes that we have at the moment. That is my, the, so the political economy, I think, argues against that because I would, the, the, the only version you might get, if we ever get a basic income, the only version we would get would be the liberal, the neoliberal, uh, basic income, which would not be on top of every social protection which have, but would replace it. And that would mean that the redistribution effects, which you talked about, that some people, the higher incomes pay more and the, low, uh, the lower incomes uh, are the net beneficiaries, that this effect would not be present. Okay. Do you want me to reply? Yeah. And then no, 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 I want you to, and then I have this. a question to... Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, obviously what we defend in the book is a version uh, which, is, which we call real libertarian or left liberal. So obviously we, we defend a liberal point of view that is giving more freedom to those who have the least freedom today. And I think very often on the left, and I'm myself a member of a trade union, but I often debate with trade unions in Belgium, and very often of the, on the left we try to justify paternalism and thinking that we know better than these people, what they need. And that's also the, some of the reasons why people prefer services sometimes, because services are useful for sure, and I'm all in favor of services, but giving cash to people gives them more freedom. And are going to make a good use of this freedom? Mm, not so sure. We defend the, this idea that we should give freedom to these people. So there is some, of course, some liberal flavor to the argument. But we defend, obviously, the idea of basic income not as a replacement for the welfare state, but as we call it, a, a modest income floor on which you can stand and which can be topped up by some complements. For instance, when you have children, you would get child benefits. You would still keep the entitlement to have contributory pensions and private pension plans, etc. Now, is that feasible? From what I know, from the work of economists working on this, it's feasible provided this, the, the basic income remains low, right? So for instance, at the, at the, in Belgium today, the most discussed scenario starts from the idea of a basic income of 600 euros a month. Uh, how is the cost covered? Not by suppressing the pensions, not by suppressing healthcare, etc. By suppressing, for instance, obviously some targeted benefits, including the minimum income existing, it's almost at this level for many people, also by suppressing, and that's key, I believe, a lot of tax expenditures that flow to the rich today, we actually give a basic income to the rich through the tax system. We should get rid of that. Obviously, this second feature raises political issues. I would agree with you to say, well, is it politically feasible? I'm not a union leader, I'm not a political actor, but I think it's worthwhile to think about that. We give basic incomes to the rich through the tax system. We should get rid of that. So in these scenarios, you have the suppression of some targeted benefits, the suppression of some tax transfers. Uh, we could also discuss, is an, in, is an unemployment insurance still needed when you have a basic income? Perhaps you can have 600 euros as a basic income supplemented, topped up by some contributory benefits. But I would agree also to say that there is an extra cost. There is an extra cost. I'm not saying that there is no. But the extra cost, you should never mix the net cost and the gross cost. The, the gross cost part of it is 
financed by what I just mentioned. But the extra cost would come from the fact that many people who do not receive anything today, and that's especially women, especially in Germany, Belgium, or France, because they have a lower employment rate, many women would receive, some, would receive a basic income, whereas they're not entitled to anything today. That's an extra cost. Young people, students, etc., would receive a basic income. That's an extra cost. I think it's worthwhile. But it, makes, it turns basic income into something that will cost money, uh, but not as much as some people say. You don't, don't multiply 600 euros by the number of Germans and come with figures like billions of uh, euros. Uh, it all depends on how you fund it. Last point, 600 euros, does it make a difference? I think it does, for reasons I just mentioned. It's a job subsidy. It would allow you to access part-time jobs, even if they are low-paid, but you're also free to refuse these jobs, so this combination is interesting. It would have a huge impact on students, I'm sure. 600 euros a month is a lot of money. It could even have an impact on people who would like to get together in a cooperative venture. So even a modest partial basic income, partial by partial I mean below the poverty threshold, would already have an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, in my country, most people in social assistance actually do not even get 600 euros. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe in a basic income at 1,500 euros. It makes, it, it's, I, I think it's impossible to reach uh, at, at least at this stage. Bruno, you base your analysis on the shift from the old social risk to the new social risk. And the old social risks are the risk for which the welfare state was uh, introduced. These are the risk of unemployment, old age, and health. And in the past, welfare scholars have always looked at the transformation and evolution of how protection system could cover old social risk. And you say, you know, if we look at those risks, these risks are very well covered by what the welfare state does, but we have new groups of people who are not covered by these institutions, and these are the groups which you have mentioned, these are young people, these are women particularly, but also single mothers. So if I listen to that, and if I listen to the distribution and the graphs which you showed, wouldn't then the basic income, which Yannick uh, proposes, wouldn't that be the answer for the new social risk? So and the first thing is, uh, Hannah, we cannot speak of shift of risks, because this would mean that we don't have uh, health issues anymore, we are not aging anymore, etc. And the, the problem is, is on top of that, because of course we are aging, we need to be uh, cured, etc. So th that's the first point. The second point is, is that's why I wanted to go to my last sl slides, is that I don't believe that you can replace uh, services by cash. Uh, and, and let me uh, develop that. So I, I think a, a basic income for students is very good and actually it's not impossible to think, just look at either UK or Sweden, they have that. Uh, then Nordic countries give something to all students, to uh, all youngsters actually uh, after the age of 18. And it's in our familiarist countries like Germany, like France, like Belgium, that uh, uh, people are supposed to be of majority, able to vote at the age of 18, but of minority until the age of 25 as, as far as social citizenship is concerned. Ask your parents until the age of 25. So this, this can be changed either through uh, uh, so ac at least access to social assistance and even better uh, to uh, an income guarantee for, for students if we consider that investing. So this, I, I wouldn't disagree. The point is that when you're poor and a child, poor and young, poor and a single mother, you don't need only money. You need more things than that. You need access to human capital. For youngsters, they need also access to housing. That's one of the key issues, having access to housing. And I know that in Germany it's less of a pressing issue, but it's starting to be in Berlin and in some other uh, cities. You need uh, also to have access to jobs. And Education is key, but also some uh, uh, follow-up, uh, following you is, is important. These are services. And giving money to people without education, without at least financial literacy, as the, the Brits would say, will not make the, the job. We, we know that and if you just give a sum of money, the use of it will be very different. And it has to do with your level of education. It has to do with your prospects in life. And we know that the poorer you are, the more consuming the money you will be, 
and not investing with that money for, uh, for, for, for the future. So this is, for me, uh, the reason why it doesn't hold. Let me turn to, to Yannick because I see really two uh, key issues. Even though we go for the 600 and then I give you something and take it back and you consider that's better than, than uh, nothing for the universal reason. And, and you are right for that. But there are two perverse effects that you don't mention. Again, on low or unqualified women, what do you think the impact will be? They will stay home. So they will have no autonomy. They will have to stay either be happy with 600 euros or be faithful to your man. That's supporting the male breadwinner model. To just say, okay, I give you that. And, and of course, you know, we know what, what happens to a long maternity leave like we do in Germany or France, very low paid. It's the unskilled women who stay home, which means that they are more removed from the labor market and they have no capacities to have their own career and their own autonomy from either the state or their husbands, and depends what we want. Second thing, you never mentioned that. What will be the impact on wage? You presuppose that having 600 euros gives you a big bargaining power against your employer. Oh, ha, ha, I can refuse a bad job. Don't you think that these days, the employers will not be able to say, hey, you got 600, I just give you a little bit more than that. And you know, the, the, who you subsidize is not to whom you give the money. Who you subsidize is to who is powerful in the economy. And I'm sorry to say, especially in front of this audience, but it seems to be that these days employers have more power than in other days to be able to set the rules, to, to set the, the, the games and to say, I, good news, you got some money, not from me, but don't expect me not to change anything in the wages, especially when I have polarization, which means that for one low-paid, low-skilled jobs, I have 400 candidates. I can do whatever I want. And where comes these candidates? From the middle of uh, the labor market, the mid-skilled, mid-pay. And they have to fall down. I can do whatever I want with them. Right? That's the political situation that is created with polarization. And I'm not sure that giving them 600 euros will change so much uh, the, the bargaining power of these people. I may be wrong. Yannick. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, what's interesting, I, I think, is that uh, it has to do with the anticipated, what your remarks have to do with the anticipated behavior of people receiving a basic income. The problem at this stage is that we only have uh, micro simulations and some, uh, some calculations about how much it would cost, etc. That's also the reason why many countries are now thinking of experimenting basic income, like in Finland, for instance, or uh, in Canada, or in the Netherlands, in Spain. Experimenting is uh, a way of testing the effect on behavior. We might come back to that because I'm quite skeptical about these experiments. But this is to say that we are here, we are, we're really speculating about uh, the possible impact of a basic income. We don't have one. Now, uh, to, to turn, to get back to your two points. Um, the first one, I think, has to do with the, what I called, I think I already mentioned that, the, or if not, I am doing it, uh, the, ice, the issue of paternalism. So protecting people against themselves and against bad decisions that they could take, especially when you mentioned the low-skilled or unqualified women that would use the basic income to stay home. Now, what we uh, try to defend in the book and what I would like to say here is that a basic income in any, uh, if it's 200, 600, 500, it improves the financial situation of women. Women, because the basic income is strictly individual, would, uh, women would be net gainers of a basic income in, under any plausible scenario when you look at it. Now, the, the question is, what will they do with this income? And what you expect is that some uh, women will use it to consume and not to invest. And here I must say that uh, I, I don't see exactly where you would put the, the cursor of paternalism versus, versus freedom, but at least I believe that some freedom is needed. For instance, I would guess, Bruno, that you would never agree with people saying that you should force women to put their kids into childcare facilities. You should probably, you would, you would disagree with the idea that you should force them. So if you rechannel 
Suppose you re-channel the resources from childcare facilities to, uh, sorry, from cash child benefits towards services, and you don't force them to put their kids into the childcare facilities, some women will stay home, but their, their financial situation will be worse than before because they lost the child benefit. And that's partly what is happening now in, in my country. Beacantillon has been doing some work on this uh, in Belgium. We have been re-channeling uh, money to the services, we have been cutting cash transfers, and we know that middle-class families make a more intensive use of these services. So it's actually a regressive policy. And it's uh, presumably the idea is that we should, we know better than these people what they should do. They should put their kids into uh, childcare facilities and we want to take freedom away from them. And I confess that here we take a bottom-up approach and we think that to some extent, not with thousands of Five, uh, 1,500 euros, between 600, 500 euros. To some extent, we should find the right balance between paternalism and, and freedom uh, given by cash. Now, to finish on this, the, the, on your second remark, the impact on, on wage, I fully agree that it's a, a tricky issue. We actually, we, we, we try to deal with that. The net effect on wages of a basic income is not clear because it's, it's the net effect of the two countervailing uh, uh, trends, the power to say no and the power to say yes. Uh, the power to say no basically uh, would probably result in higher wages, especially when the basic income is high. You can reduce working time, you can decline jobs, you can launch your own job, your own self-entrepreneurship, etc. But the power to say yes could also have an effect, a, 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 a downward effect on wages. But the, net, the total net effect is unclear as far as I'm concerned. But I think it's, a, it's an important issue and we don't really have the, the means to, to know what the exact impact of, on the basic, of the basic income uh, on this will be. Uh, I think people who defend it on the left focus on the power to say no, whereas people uh, who like the basic income on the right focus on the power to say yes. So I will give Bruno the floor to answer, but I will also ask who wants to come in next and who wants to ask a question after Bruno has answered. At the very back. So uh, this is really uh, when it comes, uh, it becomes so interesting uh, when we reach the philosophical debates, uh, you know, and uh, let me first say that uh, this, this is not a new debate. This was a 19th century debate. Should we make health insurance compulsory? Should we make old age compulsory? And at that time, people from the left, trade unions, called for it to be compulsory. Uh, because they knew that when you're poor, you have poor capacity to anticipate. And you have poor uh, financial capacity to also save money. It's not a true freedom, individual uh, freedom. If, you do, if you're poor, you don't have a choice whether to consume now or save for later. That's why in the 19th century, and Bismarck made it the first, uh, but not because he wanted, because unions pushed for it, made social insurances compulsory. You make all that paternalist against the will of people, but it's also in line with observation. My second point. When you say we don't know the impact of women, we perfectly know. We know the impact of long, poorly paid maternal leaves, three years, like we have in France, like something similar in, in Germany. No educated women take it. No one, not one. They could have the choice, you could say. They could take it. No, of course, they don't take it. They know it will destroy their career capacity. They know it will ruin their autonomy. Who takes it? The poorly educated women. Because it's still better to stay home with 600 or 500 euros than working for Lidl. Sorry to mention that, for instance. Right. So, sorry, it's not choice. There, there is something such as a society. And this is my problem with basic income. It's a true liberal, and I would say neoliberal device. And now we are reaching the bone. You think there are only individuals able to choose whatever they want, as soon as you give them 600 quid, or euros, or dollars. No, there is something like a society. There are dominations, there are power relations. And so I think we should move beyond. And then, going back to philosophy, I think it's, you have to shift from morals to sin. 
You know, if you want to speak about freedom, why not read in Amartya Sen? I think it dates from the 60s also, like Rawls. But Sen explains that you are not free on your own. To be free, you have to be educated. You have to be put in a scenery, in a scenery so that you can forge your own project. It's your own project, individual project. But it doesn't come from the sky, from the beauty of human nature. It's collectively made at school, with family, with friends, etc. That's the first thing. But you cannot fulfill your own project on your own, with your own choice. That is big difference with any other liberal thinker. He thinks that we need collective settings, policies, all lifelong, to help you reach out your own individual project. So Amartya Sen is behind social investment anyway. And I think your uh, attempt to make me on the paternity side uh, is, is a very old <laughs> binary vision uh, of freedom, which I think freedom has to be much more elaborated in, in our world, and Amartya said, can do it. If I may, uh, because I think what is really concerning all of us is the fate of more and more people who are unskilled, who are supposed to either have 600 charities or being a Uber driver, or a delivery, or a cashier at Lidl. And I think what is at stake, and I'm speaking to trade unionists here, what is at stake is to understand that these people, these women, those who are taking care of kids, those who are taking care of the elderly, those who are taking care of us, delivering, cashier, etc., they are the new proletariat of the 21st century. And they are deprived from the added value of collective production. And collective. But if you think of it, you know that all this polarization stuff says computers, what they do to job, they enhance the productivity of the brains. You know, the brilliant, creative class, blah, blah, blah. They destroy the job of the middle because it's routine-based, so a computer or robot can do what they do. And they do nothing to the low skill. That's not true. They allow more low skill jobs to be created. Look at Uber, it, it gives more possibilities to that. But the economists say these jobs, they are low skill, low productivity, low pay. I think there is something wrong here. I can work more on my brilliant ideas, whatever, if somebody brings me a pizza, if somebody else is cleaning my house, if somebody is taking care of my kids. Therefore, these people, these servants, they are contributing to my productivity, right? But they don't get any share of that. I'm the only one to be well paid. That's the fight of the future. Exactly the same fight as when, in the 19th century, people said, why should all the added value go to the owner of the firm when the workers in the firm contribute to the added value? And it was easier to see because it was in the same place in a firm, in a manufacturer. But today, even though they are not in the same place, they are not in universities, they are not in a in place, they do contribute to my productivity as an individual. And of course, those working in education, in health, in childcare, they contribute to collective uh, productivity. Therefore, we should fight not for the state to give them money afterwards, but to, for them to have a proper job, decent pay, access to training, access to social protection, there should be a mobilization to say, without these women, without these persons, we cannot have growth and jobs, and we shouldn't accept this increasing polarization between the brains and the servants. Great, great stuff. Yannick, I, I know that you want to respond to that and you will have the chance to respond to that, but let's collect three statements or questions in this debate and we start over there. Hi. Hi. Ulrike Müller, PhD candidate at the University of Kassel and working for the left in Parliament. Um, I, uh, thanks for both of your statements. I am a bit actually, uh, so my motivation, I am not favoring uh, unconditional. Uh, I'm not favoring universal, but unconditional uh, benefits. Uh, so I am not favoring uh, basic income idea, but I am very happy about the general interest uh, and awareness it increases. So I 
think we should use that to increase, uh, to raise support for higher social policy. Um, so that's why I am tired of uh, debating polarized ideas as an either or. Uh, I would really be happy to know whether there are any concrete measures the two of you can agree upon. So would there be investment strategies you, Mr. Van der Bork, could would agree uh, upon? And would there be cash uh, benefit uh, measures which you, uh, Mr. Pallier, would agree upon? Because I think we need to, to somehow to, to find uh, some common ground so to, to, have a, to, to get some concrete improvements. Okay, that is a clear question. There was another hand, no, in the very back there, Joel, whatever. Thank you, um, Rosa von Gleichen from the University of Oxford. I have um, a question to what you just said about valuing the people who are, um, who are accomplishing potentially men menial services in order to increase the productivity of great scholars like yourself. How does giving them a proper job, as you concluded by saying, value these care services? How do we attack the fundamental problem that a mother's care, which is not functionally equivalent to um, a, service, a public service provider's care, um, is not valued equally monetarily? How, by giving them a meaningful job, are we valuing their input? Okay. So we take another one, and there was, be, behind you, Joel, there wasn't... Cindy Rossi, University of Pennsylvania. Um, I, just to, to latch on to Ulrich's question, I think there is something that both panelists agree on, um, but I'm not sure it's a good thing, and, and that is that polarization seems to be a given in the labor market, that skill bias, technical change, is something that cannot be altered. And my question is that both panelists seem to treat this as a cause, but both symptom, uh, sorry, both um, solutions seem to just deal with the symptoms of this cause. And my concern is that uh, I understand that the fight should be fought on multiple fronts, but um, it seems as though not only do the two solutions deal only with symptoms rather than the underlying cause, but they might actively undermine the possibility of dealing with the, the cause itself. And by that I mean that both, both solutions are um, looking towards the state and perhaps actively undermining the possibility of, of organization in civil society, especially with trade unions, which historically at least has been the only and the best way of countering employer discretion, which would seem to be the cause of, of uh, skill bias technical change. So I'm curious just to, to ask both panelists, um, uh, can, you, can you make a strong case that your, your policy solution does not undermine uh, the capacity to actually deal with this cause of polarization in the labor market. Okay, three complex questions. Yannick, you start, and you can also reply to Bruno if you wish. Uh, okay. So for the first question, we actually had a short discussion on this um, before the panel, um, and Bruno might compl my, my compliment what I what I'm going to say, but I, I would agree with you that, of course, here I was asked to do a strong plea in favor of basic income. Uh, but I also think that it can inspire more modest and perhaps more feasible reforms. Among them, I think one has been mentioned, uh, Bruno called it the student's guaranteed income. I would rather opt for um, guaranteed income for the young, not only for students, but for people, say, between 18 and 25. Let me remind you that even in France today, the young people between 18 and 25, most of them are not even entitled to social assistance, which is a shame, and I think Bruno would agree with that. So that could be, that could be one option. Another option that can be inspired by the basic income debate is the basic pension. The basic pension exists in uh, Denmark and the Netherlands, and it really helps to improve the situation of women we have been discussing this during the conference, uh, who have uh, irregular uh, career, tem temporary jobs, part-time jobs, etc. And we, in the smart countries, women who do not manage to contribute enough to have a high pension. So everyone would be guaranteed a basic pension, and on top of this, you could have something else. Finally, one other option, I think, which is very important, especially relating to what Bruno has said earlier, 
is to individualize social rights. Today, especially in Bismarck and countries, we still have rights that are attached to uh, the, your marital status and giving in independence to individuals rather than to households is quite important. So for instance, social assistance in all European countries uh, depends on the, the, the income not of, of the individual but of the household. And it would make a big difference to individualize this right and that's quite paradoxical because when you indiv individualize, you actually foster cooperation. What you do when you have a social assistance which is means-tested in the sense that we take into account the income of the partner, you actually foster exclusion or isolation. You, you put people into the isolation trap because once, once they get together with someone else, they lose the benefit. When you give it as an individual right, you foster cooperation. So obviously, we're not against an ethics or an ethos of cooperation or an ethos of reciprocity. We actually believe that the current system is actually uh, d discouraging or, um, how should I say, uh, uh, making cooperation more difficult, right? So basic pension, uh, income, basic income for the young, and individualization of social rights in order to foster cooperation. Okay, so we have an agreement. <laughs> uh, perhaps I, I give you the floor for the, for the second one. Okay, so I agree on these three points. And, uh, and I agree with your point, which is uh, um, I, I have written that in France, and that I think uh, it's, it's a really uh, wonderful opportunity to speak about welfare systems, social policies, to have the debate about the, the basic income, because they, they ask... They point to real problems, real questions. I think that the solution is not the, the best one, but, uh, but this is, an, and, and it, it, it raises the issue, it challenges a defender of the system to, to say whether uh, or not the, system, the existing system is able to address the issues that they point to, which is non-take up, which is um, continuity, precariousness, and this kind of thing. So yeah, I, I agree with you too. Uh, this is a good opportunity for having a debate. And uh, Anker wanted it to be uh, bloody enough so that you're resistant till uh, willing to, to have her. But we have these agreements we, we perfectly have. And I, I would even go as far as saying that children should have individual rights. You know, that children should have the right to access to childcare, the right to be successful in education and these kind of things. You know, that, that we, we are in Germany and France treating children way too much as non-individual in, in, in reality, whereas they, they should be. Okay, so. Uh, I will start from uh, from your point. Uh, you know, the, so I've co-edited a book called The Age of Dualization, right? And this book is about exactly your point. So you're reproaching me what I, in the book, I reproach to the economists. And, uh, and this book shows that this dualization is an institutional construct. I've written a, a paper uh, with Cathy Thelen, uh, which is called Institutionalizing Dualism. So really my work on that issue has been to show that this is not a natural development of the labor market. This is based on policies, this is based on agreements. I will not develop too much the argument here because I want to stay alive. Um, but we have shown that, for instance, in Germany, there has been some collective agreements that led to further dualization. What well, at least some acceptance of uh, the increase in atypical jobs that indeed have enforced. So I'm not the kind of person who believes in technology is the only explanation. Okay. But on the other hand, I am not somebody who believes that it, it is enough to say stop to Uber, stop to the robots, stop to the computers to, to get rid of the problem. Right? Because we are not only workers, we are consumers, we are taxpayers, and this creates uh, pressure for the, this change to happen. And, and we should be aware of this change and whether our collective action contributes to increase it or to uh, decrease it. I think that my kind of preaching moment was clearly showing that this is the time for trade unionists first to acknowledge that there are new kinds of workers of a different gender, more female, of a different sector than just manufacturing industry that have to be defended and that are the new operator. This was exactly what I wanted to say, if ever it wasn't clear. Let me repeat it. It's 
a, a question of a collective mobilization much more than, uh, than, than, than thing. The acceptance of the polarization is also in our hands or not. I totally agree. Then comes your really quick key question. How to value care activities? Uh, you know, the, 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 that, that's the, the key question. You know, the, on the, the low tail of the, of, the, of the curve, it was there on the graph. Uh, the economists, who are men, by the way, they say these are low-skilled jobs. And I, I'm sorry, I will be, I will take in three minutes because I think it's, it's, it's really the key uh, dimension. And, and we are here to know whether we accept the world as defined as by economists or not. So neoclassical economists, they have many beliefs. One is that labor markets function so well that wage reflects productivity, okay? If you have a high wage, it's because you're very productive. If you have a low wage, it's because you're not productive. That's it. There might be other interpretation. True, very simplistic and also quite economistic. One is that it may depend on the demand and supply. If for one job there are 400 candidates, it might be that the uh, job offer uh, offer uh, the job supplier, the employer, can play with the wage without taking the productivity into question. And clearly, if we are living a period where you have less job opportunity in the middle and more on both ends, you will have people overqualified calling for uh, get getting to a job they will not get a better pay because they are too numerous over the same. That's one. The second one is more political, it's the bargaining power. And the bargaining power depends on your number, but it depends on the organization. Do you know the rate of unionization of men and women in Germany, for instance? In these sectors, the rate of unionization, in these sectors, in the care sectors, in the, uh, in the driving uh, private driver sector, in the delivering sector, in the, no, it's very low. That's. Once again, that's a conquest field, uh, clearly. Okay, anyway, so let us say we are not obliged to accept the idea that if they are low pay, it's because they have low productivity. But which productivity then? Ask these same economists. I've done that. I'm doing that all the time. Are you ready to give your children to anybody? Of course not. I want to be sure that they will be doing their job well enough, well. What is at stake with services? It's not quantity, it's quality. Do you think that a cleaning lady can be better than another one? Yes, of course. On what account? Not whether she's fast or not, on the quality aspect. That's the problem. The problem is that in services, what is at stake truly is not quantity. It's not how much you do in an hour, it's quality. Are you performing something that I am satisfied with. The problem we have is that both economists but also social partners are used to calculate productivity with quantity. And in some places, like, I don't know the, the name of the uh, place for elderly care, but do more in one hour is the way you will increase your wage. That's crazy because, of course, do, you do mistreatment to children, to elderly persons. Here comes the platform economy. What are you supposed to do when you leave the Uber drive, the Uber car? Give some stars, make some comments. I know that both French and, and Germans hate Amazon, hate Uber and these kind of things because they are exploiting the drivers, exploiting the workers in the warehouse, which is absolutely true. What we don't realize is that their business model is as much, as much based on quality in the client experience as Audi or BMW. Try to call the uh, service client, client service of Amazon. They will call you in the second, in the minute, to be true, in the minute. Try to send back something you don't like to Amazon. You can do that in free of charge, immediately. Try to find a shop doing that. There is none. The quality of the service is in the base of their uh, business model. Can they me measure it? Yes, they can. Stars. And, and so what we have to realize is that this new digital platform, platform capitalismus, as you call it, is now 
objectivizing the quality in a capitalist way, in a very exploitive way, right? If you have less than four stars, you're sucked from Uber. But it's based on quality. So I'm not saying we should do the same, but we should realize that what is at stake is quality. And we should ask ourselves, can we measure it? Can we find for quality to be recognized and to be key in our measurement of productivity in our valuation of these jobs, therefore, in uh, pay, quality of jobs, and these kind of things. That, I think, is, is really the big challenge for the servicing uh, economy. Okay. Um, ich habe da hinten noch gesehen, Sigge Botfeld, und da hinten, und Malte Lübke war auch noch da. Wir fangen mit... Um. Silke Botfeld, uh, Bremen University of Applied Science. Thank you uh, to both of you for your talks. I think it's uh, quite a good idea, idea to put these two concepts uh, together and, and then to discuss what is adequate for, our, for the future of our social security systems. I do uh, very much agree with the idea of the uh, UBI to say that Uh, it is important to increase autonomy and self-determination and so on, but I really absolutely doubt that uh, the uh, UBI itself will be the best instrument for uh, achieving this. We all know that autonomy and self-determination is the very core of every liberal democracy, so we have reasons to be for and to, st uh, to strive for that. But um, I'm quite surprised every time when uh, people who um, advocate the UBI do use this concept of autonomy in a very thin and uh, unidimensional sense, saying that having econo economic independency, what you suppose, what people would have, this would uh, uh, resolve the problems one for all. And I would argue that really to achieve autonomy you need much more. And you can take the uh, women's movement and you uh, made allusion to, to women uh, profiting from the UBI. You can just take this example to show that this is of course not the case. And the women's movement is of course, co has been concerned to uh, achieve paid employment for both men and women on, uh, on, on an equal basis basis and to have the uh, good working conditions, uh, equal pay and so on. And I think really offering a UBI with a very uh, thin and uh, inacceptable solution to the problem really to achieve equality between men and women. I think the, the other way around would be to fight for good working conditions, for better access to employment, for shorter working hours as well, of course, for everybody, men and women. And then there are still three other dimensions we should, uh, should have in mind. That uh, the, um, the picture or the image we have of a, a society is of course not neutral. So we have, um, we have a, social, a social hierarchy and we should uh, reflect that uh, people having a UBI would not have the same conditions to reintegrate into the labor market later, for example. And as Bruno has already said, they do not have the same chances to realize participation. We do talk a lot about Teilhabe in Germany. So Teilhabe is a much more and complex uh, concept of participating in social life and also in political life. So this would be my second argument. Participation is really important and can just be produced by much more complex institutional arrangement, uh, realizing and um, giving, giving way to social and political participation. And my last point would uh, be to point out that co-determination rights, those active and political rights, are really decisive. And I think the um, Greek labor minister this morning made this very clear, that we need active citizenship. So really support people, give them active rights to participate and co-determine co on working conditions, working time, and so on. And if we step away from that and focus on just a thin instrument like the UBA, I think we, should, we would lose all this, what we have been fighting for, for more than 100 years now. Yes, Margareta Steinrücke from Attack Germany. Um, I would uh, like to point out uh, three conditions under that 
the unconditional basic income could be really more, bring more freedom. First, the amount. We have here in Germany uh, Hartz IV. This is the basic social aid and uh, this is at the moment already about 780 euro. So uh, it, and we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, counting uh, an amount in, with that the basic income would be really uh, 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 opening to freedom to refuse uh, undecent uh, jobs would be here in Germany and Austria about 2050 euro. Under that minimum, it would, when you, for example, say 600 euro could be enough, this would only lead to that what uh, uh, your colleague said, it will increase a huge uh, low wage uh, sector because every employer could say, you already have uh, your basic needs uh, uh, covered. Second point, this um, amount of minimum 1,050 euro um, is really very difficult to finance, but uh, we have some concepts to uh, finance that without uh, killing all uh, social uh, security systems. For example, Attack Austria developed a real, in my eyes, realistic uh, uh, finance uh, uh, proposal, but this includes a lot of uh, higher taxes for the rich, for the uh, enterprises, for the uh, high uh, earning people, for the fortunes, etc., etc. So, but my third um, uh, point is, even when you have this amount, even when you have really a realistic finance basis for all this, the basic income would not be really bringing freedom when it would not be um, um, accompanied by another measure and this, I would say, would be the just distribution of work. Effie, the Greek uh, labor minister, said today in the morning, the right to work is really decisive for a social solidaric society. And only when you have parallel to a basic income, also the just redistribution of all existing paid work, then you will avoid what uh, um, uh, Bruno uh, uh, said before, that when you only give a basic income to everybody, you will perpetuate all the inequalities between the high skilled and the low skilled, between the genders, between the abled and the disabled, etc. And so, only when you share really the existing and remaining with our digitalization, automatization processes, there will be less uh, uh, paid work. When you will share this remaining paid work between all, then this basic income could have an um, emancipatory uh, effect. Thanks a lot to both of you for very inspiring uh, presentations. Uh, Professor Van der Boort, you built up this dichotomy between targeted benefits and universal benefits, and of course arguing for universal benefits. And I thought it was interesting that you made two examples that you thought are successful, um, child allowance and free education. And you're obviously right, they're not means tested. But I would argue they're actually good examples for targeting, because child allowance targets parents. You don't get it if you don't have a child. 
um, education is targeting children. I can't go to school. Um, the universal model would be everyone, whether they're six or 60, gets a voucher for education that you can then use for educational services. Um, so I think those examples actually could be used um, to support Dr. Pallier's argument that you need to extend uh, successful examples of welfare states, how they target specific situations, families with children, need for education, and expand that successful model to the new risk of our changing economy to, to cover that and expand the welfare state rather than uh, totally transform it, um, but actually maintain that principle of targeting, abandon the principle of means testing. I would like to ask you to comment, because we are running out of time, we only have about four or five minutes left, so oh. if you just comment on those points you think are, the, for you, the most interesting or most important, and take a couple of them and leave it at three or four minutes. Yannick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All of them are very important. Uh, I had already lost ten seconds by saying that. Um, the, the, the question about uh, your question was very important, I think, about uh, inc economic independence, self-determination, etc. I don't know if I can answer that in a, in a few seconds, but uh, I think that the idea of autonomy, as you say, is central in our argument in favor of a basic income. And it reminds me that, for, for once, I can cite, quote, a German sociologist. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Hartmut Rosa from the Frankfurt School. He's now one of the big advocates of basic income in, uh, uh, in um, Germany. And his work is focusing on the project of modernity, which is autonomy, giving autonomy. And the basic income actually, yeah, you could say it gives cash to people, but it gives time to people, time to pursue their own conception of the good life. That's what we try to show in the book. Uh, and the, the feminist movement has been quite ambivalent on this. Some women, including Carol Pateman, for instance, a prominent feminist, is advocating a basic income because they believe that basic income gives women an income of their own which most of them don't have when they don't work. It gives them an exit option. You remember the exit option I mentioned was exit from employment, but it can also be an exit option from abusive relationships. Once again, it, uh, this exit option is better when you have a higher basic income, but it still exists with a, with a small one. And one uh, reason why I say that is in the negative, when well, the basic income experiments in the US in the 70s, one of the puzzling impacts of the basic income was the higher divorce rate in the samples. Higher divorce rates because women who enjoyed the benefit of the basic income uh, exited uh, abusive relationships. So to be further discussed, but I think uh, we can obviously defend basic income from the point of view of giving more autonomy to people if it's, even if it's not the only thing we need. Uh, Jen, then before I give the floor to Bruno, then just to focus on your question very briefly, we can get back to the other question later on uh, in the discussion after the panel. Uh, I, I'm a bit puzzled by what you say because you say, what I say targeting is for me is means testing, right? So the child benefit is not means tested. Obviously it's targeted to some extent on children. Parents. Parents g receive the money because we cannot give it to the children. But it's given to everyone within that category. Uh, so in some sense, it targets one category. People under the age of, in, in Belgium, it's actually under the age of 25. I don't know about Germany. But it's, it's everyone within that age category gets it. So I think it's a universal benefit, not a targeted one. And about education, you say you cannot go to school. Ideally, I guess, especially in a social investment strategy, you should be entitled to universal services in terms of long, lifelong education. I think it's, it would be key. Let me just finish by saying one last thing, if I may, about we had a huge discussion here about decent jobs, etc. And I listened to Bruno saying that uh, basically uh, we tend to defend uh, uh, degrading jobs, etc. Uh, we have. Um, we have here in this discussion, once again, I would use the, the, the word uh, paternalism. I know, I actually know a lot of young people, including my own students, who really enjoy these small jobs that you consider degrading. Some of them work for Deliveroo, some of them, them work for Uber. 
Uh, they liked it. I even met a union leader in Belgium who was very puzzled because his daughter is working as a cashier on Sundays. On Sundays in Catholic Flanders. And he was very puzzled because she likes it. It gives her flexibility to earn little income during the weekend. So we often think that these jobs are non-decent, which would suppress the jobs, etc. But actually some people enjoy doing them. It gives them dignity, it gives them a small income. And I think we should be careful not to dismiss the jobs too easily. And we should never think that everyone can do a highly skilled job. I mean, some of these jobs will have to remain because they are an entry point on the labor market for young people, for migrants who do not know the language, etc., etc. Sorry. Um, yeah, the day you will take this job, I will uh, buy your argument. Uh, I am defending the fact that in the US and in Sweden, uh, students are taking Mac jobs. That's, as you said, it's an entry into the labor market. They enjoy it because it, they know it's not their, their job for life. You know, that's, that, that, that. So you, you cannot just isolate it from, from there. I think it's not a very good argument, actually. Um, when you say gift times, this, to add up on the agreements, uh, and, you know, the, your question, I think, you know, really, and looking at, you may know that there is this international attempt, My Basic Income. They do a lottery. They give uh, basic income to uh, the, the few persons and they ask the person to say what they have. And what, what it is in, in reality is a one-year sabbatical, paid sabbatical, and I think that's good. That's what we need in, in our uh, ever-changing society, but not for the life and, and not for everybody. Everybody should be entitled at some point in their life to have a, a, a paid sabbatical. This, this I, I would agree. What, where I totally agree also is that we need to secure transition. Uh, we need to smoothen transition, and there is a need for, for money there. But I think that technology, I think that some countries show that you, we could have an easier, much more automatic access to uh, means-tested uh, basic uh, income than what we do uh, in France, than what you do in Germany. In Germany, in France, you have to, th to go through paperwork, through e examination. It takes time. There is a, a, always a, a suspicion about the, whether you are frauding or not. And we know that uh, those who are frauding are the employers not paying social contribution much more in amount than uh, unemployed uh, misusing benefits. So we could be there following your logic, which is let us give automatically as soon as you say, I need it because I have no job, so I give the money. And then you check afterwards. And then that's more the British way of doing, for instance. So it, 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 I think it's feasible, and we should work on that. And we would have the same freedom to say no. You know, the reservation wage, you don't need to give money to everybody to have a reservation wage. You just need to have the possibility to have a high social minimum. That's the Nordic model, once again. The Nordic, they know that they can refuse bad jobs because they would get 900 euros anyway. And it's not universal. It's not given and taken back by anybody. So let us make a uh, merged automatic access to not many different means tested benefits, but to one. And in that case, you have your uh, capacity to say no, which I think is very important. And you have you don't have all this complex uh, argumentation on how to distribute, what to take uh, out, and, and, and this kind of thing. So I think, once again, I welcome very much the debate. Uh, I think you, you guys raise uh, very good points. I never accuse you to degrade jobs. That, that's uh, just mentioning the, 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 the bad jobs. But let us think of alternative, more feasible solutions than this one that we should know. I mean, uh, Philip. Van Parijs is arguing for it since 1972. He has been using all the possible arguments with all the possible elite from the left to the World Bank in the mid-90s when the World Bank was extremely neoliberal. There is some flaws there, I would say, philosophical, practical ones. But you ask very good questions. Let us find alternative solution, which is not back to the old Bismarckian social insurances, as I tried to say, but which is to improve our capacity to provide income at any point in time when you need it, 
and to check afterwards. To provide capacities to have time, to provide capacities to in increase the bargaining power, but frankly, you don't need to actually give the money. Just say, if you're not obliged to accept this job because you can have something else, right? And this, this is feasible. So I think there are many good points that we can have alternately. That's why we need to continue to debate. Thank you very much, both of you. I spent actually quite a lot of time discussing the basic income, and I often see that at the end of the debate, we come up with solutions that are more joint solutions rather than the dividing solutions. Often the, the people, the activists on the ground, they feel very emotional about the basic income. It has to be the basic income. If you discuss it in a panel like this, very often we come to, to the point we need both. We, we need better services, we need better education, we need to do something about bad jobs, but we need also need some more flexibility when it comes to cash benefits. And we need sabbaticals, we need better payments during vocational training, etc. So this result now here is not so surprising because I often experience that in, in these discussions. I would, li would like to thank you both, and we also have to come to the end of our Herbstforum now. So, so jetzt werde ich wieder in, in Deutsch sprechen. Um, weil wir ich kann jetzt die Diskussion der letzten zwei Tage nicht zusammenfassen. Ich werde es auch nicht versuchen. Ich glaube, dass wir viele Themen angesprochen haben, die auch uns in, immer wieder in die richtige Richtung weisen, nämlich dass es soziale Probleme, zunehmende soziale Probleme gibt, für die wir neue Lösungen brauchen. Und diese neuen Lösungen werden diskutiert auf ganz unterschiedlichen Ebenen. Sie werden unter den Juristen diskutiert, den Sozialwissenschaftlern, bei den Gewerkschaften, aber auch bei allen anderen und sie befinden statt auf der europäischen Ebene, auf der nationalen Ebene, aber auch auf der betrieblichen Ebene. Also die Themen sind alle da. Wir haben sie angesprochen, wir haben sie diskutiert. Wir werden sie hier nicht zum Ende bringen, sondern wir werden nächstes Jahr wieder ein Herbstforum haben, wo wir die Themen weiter diskutieren. Was ich jetzt nur noch tun kann, ist wirklich allen zu danken, die hier waren, alle, die hier auf dem Panel saßen, die einen Vortrag gehalten haben, aber auch alle, die sich an der Diskussion beteiligt haben. Ich möchte mich zudem noch bedanken bei den Dolmetschern, die jetzt zwei Tage hart für uns gearbeitet haben. Ich möchte mich bei der Technik bedanken, die auch jetzt zwei Tage bei uns waren und uns gute äh, Dienste geleistet haben, aber natürlich auch denen, die hinter den Kulissen für uns, für die Organisation ähm, uns hilfreich äh, geholfen haben. Und ich möchte mich insbesondere bedanken... bei denen, die, glaube ich, jetzt gar nicht im Raum sind, aber ich nenne sie dennoch, nämlich bei Claudia Müller, Andrea Heckenbach, bei Athena Anastasi Anastasiadu, bei Simon Eberhardt, bei Katharina Molitor, bei Joel, Joel van Horde, die hier hinter den Kulissen uns immer wieder die Sachen aufbereitet haben. Herzlichen Dank. Ich hoffe, Sie kommen gut nach Hause und ich hoffe, Sie sind nächstes Jahr auch wieder beim Herbstforum dabei. Dankeschön. Applaus